All right. We are live. Another free range American, Trevor Thompson, sits to my left, and we are joined by Pranay Mangalarmani. Yeah? Munger, Munger Milani. Munger <laughs> Milani. Okay. Munger Milani. Uh, common spelling, you know? It was closer than the first six times. Yeah. Who is a <laughs> firefighter with Cal Fire out in California right now. Thank you so much for right. jumping on, man. I really no, appreciate absolutely. it. No, thank you so much for having me, guys. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. And before we get into the the whole situation with everything that's going on in the West and and all the wildfires happening right now, um, we we started getting into your to your background a little bit. And an, another guy who who really fits the definition for for free range Americans. So, can I give us the the one two punch on, on uh, how you get to where you are right now? Yeah, absolutely, man. So you know, I, I grew up in the in the San Francisco Bay Area. Specifically, the eastern side. Uh, you know, grew up to two immigrant parents. Mother was from India, and dad was from Pakistan. And you know, I had kind of interest in not the normal route of an East Indian, you know, kid. Whether it's being a doctor, <laughs> right? <laughs> being a doctor, working for you know a tech company, and I was like, shit, let me do something you know a little bit different. So actually, my mom got me in Boy Scouts. I thought it was the weirdest thing, man. I was a, the corniest little kid, and uh, I got into Got into Boy Scouts and went up that route. Got my Eagle Scout. You know, it was that first aid mirror badge. And uh, we had the local fire department. They came down and taught it. And my eyes were like, like huge. So I went I went through and, and talked to those guys. And, and from there, uh, you know, the wheel started rolling. You know, got into like an explore yeah. with the local fire department with Cal Fire. And then it spun off. And then, uh, you know, ended up uh, becoming a fireman, you know, when I was 18, graduated high school early, went through there and got hired by the National Park Service, originally down in Sequoia National okay. Park. Yeah, just uh, east of Fresno, California out there. And then it just spun off of there. And, you know, here I am now. Very cool. Cool. And then yeah. where does the, the when did you uh, also join the military? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. I left that out. So, <laughs> so <laughs> just a minor <laughs> detail. <It's> okay. <laughs> just a minor detail. Yeah. No, no worries. Um, you know, my hats off for you guys and, and all veterans out there. And we got a great program in our apartment too, where we hire tons of vets. So working awesome. seasonally, you know, six to nine months, um, you know, I got laid off and I was interested in the military. It was just one of those times, you know, lack of father figure type of stuff, trying to figure out my own way. I actually became a law enforcement officer for a little bit in Northern California and the marijuana Emerald triangle that we all hear about. Yeah. We can go into depth about that. And, uh, enlisted. I was like, you don't know, want to do something cool. I want to do something that correlates to my civilian job and uh, join the Air National Guard. It's the 129th Rescue Wing down there in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, went to Lackland and then went to Fort Leonard Wood for my tech school out there in Missouri. Horrific place. Don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Go well, out there. Yeah. <laughs> which I have to assume really plays to your advantage now with the amount of National Guard people who have been activated to, to help respond to the fires like are, are you kind of being utilized as a liaison in, in a capacity right yeah so when you see that so um the campfire which is in butte county california excuse me uh in 2018 uh was a huge activation for the california national guard as well and that was probably one of the largest wildfire cooperating agency things between the state office right. of emergency services and the California Air and Army National Guard. So I was there for 47 days, I want to say, um, as a National Guardsman. So I was there as a E4, as a senior airman. Essentially, they were like, hey, Pernay, you work for Cal Fire. You're also in the National Guard. Often, you know, <clears throat> chain of command in the military is a lot different than chain of command, you know, right. when it comes to law enforcement and fire. Sometimes you'll have a 06 walking in there trying to talk to a firefighter. But, you know, at that level, at that scene, that firefighter outranks that 06, and they don't like that. So, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you got to sit there and be like, "All right, you need to shake hands right now." But this guy's in charge. So, sorry, Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, are, are, are you kind of getting pulled? Like, you know, Cal Fire, the military aspect. Like, I, I have to imagine that, like, both these agencies are like, oh, it's, it's your a pain in the ass, right? absolutely yeah. right. So, just like with the National Guard, they say, you know, you drop everything: weekend warrior, citizen, soldier, airman. You drop your civilian job and go work. Well, it's kind of a hard deal because, you know, if I leave my work, you know, a fire engine gets parked. So it's not really that way. Luckily, with the support with my unit, we have so many of our PayPal helicopters and our C-130s as well. HC-130s, excuse me, that are, uh, 
you know, involved with rescue operations and water drops and bucket drops that they kind of were like, all right, you know, keep on doing what you're doing, you know, make up your drills later or whatever. Right. You know? So yeah. That's so good. look at a good rapport. Absolutely. Awesome. And, yeah. um, you, you were telling me earlier, you, you, uh, Medford, Oregon is your hometown. And so Correct. like you, you're, you're the guy in addition to, to all the things, um, you're capable of doing through your profession, like this directly impacted you on a very personal level right absolutely absolutely um you know you never would think you know evacuating hundreds of homes throughout the years i've been doing this and you see the peril and turmoil in the community you know all you can do is help and you just get back on that fire engine and do it again every single day and uh yeah throughout the years there's been a lot of members of our agencies and all fire departments you know in california oregon washington the guys have lost their home so I was actually at home for my son's birthday and, uh, you know, woke up the next morning. I had two days, two days off, which was, which was more than most guys had, you know, my, my two yeah. days off schedule. I was blessed to have just those two days off, but guys have been on the line right now for 40, 50 days and, you know, not one day off. Yeah. And that's, that's just going, uh, yeah. And a wildfire started. So, uh, we had a fire down there in Southern Oregon. It was all over the news. I think just this morning I was getting off the fire line and uh, got back in the cell reception. I think I saw something like 3,200 homes were taken out. So uh, the ladies, you know, mother, grandmother, they all got evacuated and precautionary. Luckily, you know, every one of my family, their homes were safe, but unfortunately I know a few people that, uh, you know, weren't in that same predicament. So. Well, yeah, I, I was kind of going through your Instagram feed and looking at trying to like pull together the stats because oh. the scale of this, whole situation at this point is freaking enormous and uh one of your like 96 percent of all cal fire guys have have been activated like twelve thousand firefighters and 266 crews are all working right now right or has that Absolutely. even increased from that point it has it has i think the last that was like fourteen thousand. i think i think it increased oh, a little bit but yeah, I've seen firefighters just on the line. It's like guys from Texas, Dallas. You know, these guys are coming in cowboy boots. It was the funniest yeah. thing. <laughs> I'm sitting there down in the Bay Area. And I'm like, who in the heck are these guys? You know, cowboy hats, little five-gallon buckets and, you know, boots on. And you know, Dallas, Fort Worth guys, you know, and bless their hearts for coming out. But guys from all over the States and women in uh, Australia, all have Canada, Mexico, Israel. So really? people are coming out from, from all, yeah. So they came out like on the train. I didn't see them in person, but you know, we saw it all online. Gosh. So a, world, a worldwide response. For yeah. Sure. So kind of similar to the situation that happened in Australia earlier this year. And there, there was, exactly. there, there's a global movement on that front to get people in aid. Like we pretty much activated everything we can activate at this point. Sure thing. Absolutely. I mean, it's a common balance, which is, a few pay grades above my head, but, you know, keeping normal staffing in the hometowns, right? Because normal grass fires, normal house fires, medical calls, those are all still occurring. But then also you have these large scale incidents that are just sucking up resources all the way from firemen at chief level. So it's like, how do we balance keeping the homeland safe, but also send enough resources? So that's been a common battle of that, that balance. And, and, you know, there's, there's people who you know do that as a full-time job, how to you know, track movement and people in these command centers. Right. Right. And so there's, there's so many of these fires at this point. Like, uh, like I mean, they're everywhere from the Rockies yeah. on yeah. over. Like it's, it's from Colorado <laughs> all the way out to the Pacific yeah. ocean. It, and it really so feels nice. like yeah. this perfect storm. Like as far as the condition goes in one publication, even like there was a lightning sieges that yeah. are, that are attributing to, to all these things getting going. And like, what, what, What's like happening on the ground from your perspective? Like, wh what are you doing? So <clears throat> right now, you know, I'm assigned on a, a strike team is what we call it. Okay. And uh, the strike team is, you know, five engines of the like type with, with a leader happens to be a battalion chief. So I'm on the North complex fires what I'm assigned to right now. So that is in the same area of the campfire. Unfortunately, uh, this community has been just hit hard. Uh, they had that Orville dam disaster that almost, broke which was a few years ago as well and almost you know could have flooded the whole area due to torrential rainstorm and then the campfire which we've seen that you know netflix documentaries things like that and now this fire so this community has been hard hit you know extremely hard and so on the ground you know our five engines we work 24 hours on 24 hours off so 
So uh, whether it's sleeping in a base camp or a hotel on our 24 hours off or not now, and then uh, we're on the line for another 24 hours straight. Um, yeah, various assignments, whether it's structure, protection in the wildland, urban interface, bumping homes is what we call it from house to house with a fire front coming, you know, mopping up clean edges, falling trees, um, you know, holding lines or even, you know, setting backfires. So there's, there's all kinds of different you know, tactics involved with what those assignments may be, and they may change every day. So. Yeah, and that, that's all determined on condition and weather and like what's at stake and, and where you need to push the fire around. Cause I, Absolutely. Because I assume so, you're pushing yeah. as opposed to trying to put it out. Like you're, you're trying to control and move it. Right. So, I mean, these fires are so big. I think what I wrote down is like the thing's over 273,000 acres this morning. This current fire level. So, yeah. So, that's not putting out like a, you know, normal, we call normal, right? Right. A, a simple quarter acre grass fire on the side of a tree without any homes or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So this big, it's like you're not you don't have enough water, right? You're not sitting there putting it out. So essentially, you, there's there's fire line. You, you make a box, and essentially, okay, here's the, you know there's trigger points. Do you want the fire to come out to this way or that way? And then, uh, like you said, you know, push fire into it, or even let fire and, and pull it towards this line where we set up hose lays. Okay, and, and go from there. Yeah. And like last week, um, I was elk hunting with Evan and his dad, and on Monday, it was like 80 degrees. The next morning we woke up, it was 20, snow on the ground. And we came back down to Salt Lake and they were like hurricane level winds. Like every 200 feet or so, there was a semi turned over. I think the total count of like semis on their side on the highway was like 40, just on one strip of the, of the 15. And uh, one of the parks here was just absolutely decimated. So, like, I have to imagine, like, these, the wind conditions were, were fairly similar out there in Cali. It's where it's like, you're, you're probably just like, are you fucking serious right now, man? Like, <laughs> it, can oh, it, where's that, where's, where's that weather at? Send it over my way. Please. <laughs> you know, we needed it. But... Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. The, uh, I saw like a, an imagery thing and it's like the the there's so much smoke it's actually made its way to europe at this point no geez yeah. i didn't even saw that whole it's wrapped all the way wild. around yeah yeah I'm all the way back do you feel like this is the worst it's been you know i've been doing this for five five seasons i should say five years the firefighting part of it yeah and absolutely within the five you know it's hard it's a hard thing to say because you know what Say it was a slow year, you know, and firefighting was a slow year, but one person's homes burnt down on a one acre fire. You know, that was their worst fire season. So it's hard to say that sometimes because you know, just, for that person, it was their worst fire season. You know, they lost yeah. all their belongings and everything. So I try to, in the actual, like I should say, incident activity form, absolutely. I think, you know, 2020 has been a wild year. I mean, we went all types of stuff from just, you know, staffing issues and things like that to, uh, you know, just the activity, that lightning siege. Like, I mean, there's literally fires, literally no joke, you know, from, from a fire that crossed into Oregon from California all the way down to the Mexican border. And and every agency in the world, whether it's U.S. Naval out of San Diego, their their fire department was up here. Um, all the way to some local tribal volunteer department to the state, the federal government. I mean, literally everyone is out here to, you know, a volunteer. So I think this is definitely this year has been quite the year. And I should even say this. It's, I don't even want to jinx myself, but historically we're not even at the worst part. Yeah. yeah and, and I think I saw a, uh, like a number statistic that we're kind of on average for acreage of burn, but it's all happened in such a tight amount of time. Like, yeah, we have the same amount of burned stuff this year, calendar year as it's been in years previous, but Jesus, it's all happened in like one month as opposed to over the course of the summer. Like people are like, oh, it's not as bad. Like it is worse. It's worse because it's all happening now. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why there was some stat that our department put out. I think it's on our Facebook or Instagram, the Cal Fire page. And I want to say it was like 200 more percent or something like that currently compared to last year, acreage burn. So it was like 200% or something like that. And, and I, you know, don't quote me on that. You got to look on the, you know, the website, but I was like, 
geez. And, and absolutely. I mean, we've had guys that, like I was saying, forever. You know, and, and that's the hard part about this job. Yeah. Yeah. And as we sit here and record this, it's uh, September 16th. Uh, when did you like really, when did this period start for you? Um, I want to say around, I'm going to think. You know, it, it kind of started in, in May almost. Like, it was like <laughs> I love yeah, that. Like you've I mean, you've been in the grind for so long, you can, you don't even know how long you've been doing yeah. it. What day? Like, oh god, I, I don't even know. Yeah, it's like I gotta look. I gotta look on my watch. I'm like, I yeah, just embrace the suck at this point. You know, it's, yeah. it's been a while. But like I said, like so many guys have been on longer than me too. So it's you know, I had a, like a 29 day stretch with two days off. You know, like a 30 day stretch or something like that. You know, like one two days off. And and guys haven't had those days off, you know, just might add some pre you know commitments more or something like that, and just happened everything lined up that I got, you know I was extra that day, or or whatever it may be, my son's birthday, you know. But I mean that was a blessing, this guys. I mean I was just off the phone with one of my buddies, and uh, you know yeah, I think it was like four, day fifty seven is what he said he's on. So it's like you know it, it's a mess. It is a mess. Yeah. And they were, yeah, they kind of started talking about like uh, everybody was kind of hopeful for for some rain to come in, and it's not looking like that's really going to happen. And are, are you just of the mindset right now that um, you don't really have a, an end for it? Correct. <laughs> to say at least, um, we're in it. You know, we're we're, we're in the mess right now, and uh, just like. The same thing in the military mindset, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And we got to deal with it. And luckily, we have an excellent crew out here. You know, we're bumping some too short in the fire engine and stuff just to keep ourselves up at two in the morning. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. And, and that's just what it is. It's like, you know, a horrible hill we got to climb or we got to sit there and, and shiver our butts off in the middle of the night when it gets kind of cold. So we just figure it out and go for it. And that's the mentality down here. You just kind of see that with everyone. Um, do you know we were, we we're talking off camera but you know the politics and everything like that that what can go into this huge mess and what you think is right or wrong but at the end of the day that every single fireman on the ground we're all just like you know let's put this out let's protect the you know, life property and the environment and that's it and we all want to get through this together yeah from from what you've been posting online it seems like the different agencies are are working together well well i mean fire Absolutely. doesn't pick a side right right fire is is it doesn't have a side going to burn one way or the other absolutely yeah and that's and you see you know green fire engines red yellow white black and uh at the end of the day you know the, the public doesn't care right they want the fire out we all we all do the job you know and say well for this you know paycheck comes from here every department has their own politics and every department you know has their own staffing levels and fight fire a little bit differently but california is california and it's been like that so yeah it's, uh, there's well and what ecologically it's been kind of a long time coming just due to how a lot of the states have had their their forestry being managed you know it it's tough to get a handle on a lot of it and this was like a perfect storm right like there's a lot of undergrowth there's a lot of younger forests that are really tight there's a lot of trees so they've been sucking a lot of water out of the aquifers so it's just going to be dry so unfortunately this year was everything came together in a bad way you know so absolutely hopefully, yeah hopefully, hopefully it's that. Hopefully it's, you know, going to slow down in the next decade. Yeah, you, you know, we, we almost, in a, in a joking, tactful way, every year we're like, how is there still more land to burn in California? <laughs> yeah. You know? Isn't and it all part, done? Like, yeah, like, geez, you know, but, you know, it, it grows back and, you know, it's a big state. Yeah. So there's just, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable some of the fire activity that, you know, I've, I've seen this year and the rates of spread of the initial fires and how quick they've grown so fast. And, you know, unfortunately, like I said, like, like back home, you know, whole communities devastated and gone again. And it's just, uh, it's a whole trickling effect. You know, you know, the social economic way about it and, you know, increase the homeless population and businesses shut down. And it's a whole trickling effect when wildfire, you know, comes through a community. I mean, it's, so, as, it's as far as, uh, I heard Portland and Spokane, shut down their airports today because of air quality. They don't want their staff working. That's how bad that is. Like it's, it's affecting oh, things that, that people don't even know are being affected. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, we speak of that in the, 
the other half. She's, uh, you know, is on her way from the East coast and, uh, same thing. Yeah. She sat in, she sat in Seattle and couldn't get, couldn't get down South to home to Medford. Yeah. I had to take a car just for that reason. And yeah, you see stuff, there's a local coffee chain up North Dutch brothers, you know, up yeah. there. And, uh, same thing. They shut down all their, excuse me, all their, uh, coffee stands due to the fact that the, the part particular matter is just so high in the smoke. So if it's not COVID, it's wildfires. You know? Yeah. <laughs> 2020 is going great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, poor <laughs> horseman. Uh, so I think this know, is... Go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, so I think this is a really interesting opportunity to to kind of educate the public on like what specifically you guys are doing. And, um, you know, I personally have seen more media about what you guys are doing now than than I feel like I've seen in the past. Um, and, and you see a lot of tools being implemented um, within what you guys are doing. W- will you talk through like some of the s- actual items and like tools and shit that you guys are using for your job? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So like I was saying, there's different types of fire engines and they're actually typed out. And this is actually on a uh, national wildfire coordination group NWCG, we have things in California called you know, Fire Scope and OES and all the 100 million acronyms that we all love in the fire service and, and military. Yeah. And these, the, yeah, the, I, yeah, too much to even memorize, but we can shorten all these know, words. Yeah, just like fire engine. We can just call it out that. Yeah, hello, hello, <laughs> hello, whirly bird, you know? So we have a, these type three engines are four wheel drive you know, engines, uh, international chassis, you know, 500 gallons of water, 500 gallon per minute pumps on there. And that's kind of the standard that we use to combat these wildfires. Like Cal Fire, we're all risk agency, all risk, you know, we go to structure fires, we're EMTs, go to hazardous materials, skulls, things like that. Then you have the Forest Service, which, uh, you know, a federal agency, it's primarily strictly for wildland fires. So we do a little bit of different stuff, but in the end, we all put out fires and we, we focus on different stuff on fire assignments. So, uh, we use the fire engines for on the ground, um, strictly there, setting up hose lays using McLeods and just the Pulaski's, you know, normal, you know, chainsaws to fall trees, yeah. uh, pole saws, just different stuff, rhinos, we call them, things like that. So just normal hand tools to cut fire line. You know, when a wildfire you know, comes through an area, you got to take out a couple things, you know, heat, oxygen, or fuel. And without one of those three, the fire goes out. So taking out the fuel, that's what we used to, to dig fire line down to bare mineral soil take that so the fire doesn't spread anymore and you know eventually hopefully hopefully it'll go out um so that we, we couple of bulldozers we call it you know just iron coming through there it's an essential part of it we call it a chain and a chain is 66 feet so the chains per hour versus like a 20 person hand crew engine compared to a bulldozer is right. significant you know yeah. a d6 rolls through there and a nice cat just takes out everything um that coupled with aircraft well, that's been a huge subject this year, especially. And unfortunately, the last few weeks, it's not been a thing because it's been so smoky. The whole Bay Area, so especially San so Francisco. They can't fly. Be... Correct. Yeah, they can't fly usually. I mean, you guys saw what I think it was the 40th, uh, what was it, the 40th uh, CAB, I believe, out there out of Fresno. You know, that, that rescue that they performed, which is pretty badass. And, uh, you know, that night vision, things like that, running knobs on copters and ships. And that's the thing that we're, you know, eventually going to, you see, you see that in LA County, they run those types of helicopters. So you have the national guard, which actually is activated. They actually want a joint venture with the forest service. And they actually put retarded in those air, uh, C one thirties, so actual us air force C one thirties loaded in the back. And, uh, those coupled with our own aircraft, and contract aircraft and we purchased all kinds of different stuff. So it, it, it's huge. The aerial asset and the, the dozer aspect and hand crews, they all make everyone works together. Right. So, I'm getting at. Yeah. so that, that communication process when you're communicating with air, um, how, how does that work to where like, how are you deciding where that water or whatever type of liquid you're pouring on the ground? Like what's that process like? Yeah, we'll be, we'll be hope, you know, hopefully it would be beer coming out of those air tanks. <laughs> that would be the best. <laughs> but, uh, so we have a, a thing called an air, air attack. 
So that's basically a, a, a commander, you would say, a supervisor mm-hmm. in the air that flies around. He's he's overseeing that air show. He's talking to a, a commander on the ground, usually the incident commander on a, on a frequency. And they're coordinating together. And with the air attack, he's basically, you can call it a spotting plane. You hear things like that. You can see things a lot better from the air. You right. see, like, okay, hey, you're getting a flare up on Division X ray or Division Alpha. All right, hey, we're going to send some ground resources in there. I need a couple of drops. So it's effective too because you have to have when the retardant drops or the water drops out of a helicopter or an air tanker, it's imperative to have the ground crews because they get in there, then they're going to fall trees, they're going to mix up that soil. And that's how the fire stops, you know, and obviously like the word retardant, you know, it doesn't necessarily put fires out. So that's where a lot of people get confused. You see that red stuff falling out of the sky. It's usually right in front of where the fire is going to go to slow it down to get those ground resources in. Gotcha. Quickly. Oh, okay. So it's giving yeah. them, it's giving them time. It's, it's like a Correct. gap. They're, they're gapping themselves so that they have time to then dig the line to stop, to truly stop that fire from pushing. Absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of times it's ineffective as well. You know, if that fires, they'll just you know chew through the retardant itself or spot over. You know, and and some of these fires this year we've seen mile long spotting just due to the wind. So in an amber wash, you know, literally it, it's hard for even me to imagine to see that. But you know, these firs or all these trees and yeah, shooting embers a mile ahead of the fire and then starting another fire. So that's where the wind play comes into effect. Yeah, yeah, and. When you guys are on the ground starting fires to to direct it kind of where you want to go, like what what devices are you using and, and what's the thought process and how are you deciding like where to start and to kind of direct it where you guys want to go? So usually when it comes up to we have our, our, our division group supervisors along with our incident commanders and you know every day they have planning meetings with these incident management teams and they get together and they look at it and say, hey, will it be more effective to put in a hose lay and put this fire out or can we use a natural barrier such as you know, a river or a massive rock outcrop or, or a highway you know, and say, let's fire off this road. We're going to hold the line with a hose lay and we're going to push. So uh, weather is huge. Like we're expecting north winds or south winds, the humidity and the temperature. We, we look at all those different features and say, you know, we don't want it. God forbid we light a fire and we lose that, you know, and make it a bigger issue. Uh, yeah. Like if you, if you put yeah. a backfire in to try and get it to move somewhere and then it goes somewhere that you didn't expect, that'd be a nightmare. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, yeah. So that's why it's, it's, a, it, it's, there, there's a checklist for it. You know, you have to get certain approvals to get authorization to actually put fire on the ground and say, hey, we're doing a backfire for the situation. And uh, the second part of that is um, the devices that we use. So you have, you know, a drip torch, which is a diesel and gasoline mix that we use. And uh, we carry those on all of our fire engines. So you'll light that. And that's just a drip torch just drops out of there with a wick on there. Um, we have fusees, essentially a, a hyped up road flare that we use. And then um, a couple of these little bombs essentially and it's like little fireworks so little handheld little grenade things with the fuse attached to it we got them and bombs away so we got a couple different things that we could use um it's really impressive too is we have uh ping pong balls and and torches attached by helicopters as well so these ping pong balls are infused in there and essentially they're lit on fire and they they drop essentially a napalm type of thing into the forest so especially the uh, the hella torches as well, yeah, which is a drip torch on, you know, on crack. And what what yeah what what aircraft is that dropped out of typically? Uh, a Hueys. So we have some Hueys and we have some Blackhawks in Cal Fire. We just bought a bunch of Blackhawks, so brand new Sikorskys, and we have some uh, some Bell two hundred fives, old Vietnam era helicopters oh, wow. that are outfitted. The single engines. Single engines, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah no two twelve. Oh man. 
<laughs> 205. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, they're there. We have a, a whole awesome aviation management unit in yeah. McClellan Park. It's where the president was at the other day. And, um, yeah, and, and they're based out of the whole the whole state. So we use those for initial attack fires. And they all have hoist capabilities as well. And they're staffed with a, with a hand crew as well with firefighters. So they can insert them down into the fire and pick them up. And they do bucket work or the new Blackhawks have fixed tanks on them as well for water. Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah. dude, this is so cool getting down the yeah, rabbit hole. A, a, fr- <laughs> a friend of mine uh, flies the K Maxes up in uh, Montana, yeah. Colorado area. And uh, he was saying that um, they're trying to move away for the wildfire stuff, uh, away from the smoke jumpers towards like repelling and uh, the guys wrapping into the fires off the birds. And have you seen that moving that direction, like more repel work, a little more like strategic placement of guys as opposed to jumping? Is there any jumping going on out there? Uh, or? Sure, people are. There curious. are, yeah. So the smoke jumper base, there's one in California, and that's out of Redding, Redding, yep. California. And um, that's uh, their Forest Service employees. So they're, they're typically used on forest fire, I say forest fires, the U.S. forest property, I yeah. should say. I mean, there's 18 national forests in California. So those are typically used on those just extreme, extreme, extreme remote areas where, you know, it might be three, four hours that we even get in there by engine. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely an elite group. You know, those guys, you know, the hot shots we all hear. We've heard about the Grand Mountain hot shots and Prescott over there years ago in the movies that came from that. I mean, those guys are hot shots, but jump out of planes. So, you know, the most crazy, crazy guys out there for sure. Um, but I don't know if there's maybe a movement. I, th- I think they're definitely essential for their needs. You know, there's yeah, a lot of right. fires that they have to be used on for sure. That, you know, luckily they're there. So you, you see that more in more wooded wooded areas gotcha. for initial attack type of things yeah so um if if somebody wants to begin the process to kind of get to what you're doing what what does that look like like how does a individual if they you know wanted to get on that career path to to do what you do what's the the process you have to go through yes first you know 18 years old um, just like anything um, go through and what I, what I recommend, you know, my route is I went to, uh, we call it a fire academy. You know, you, I paid out of pocket, went through a fire academy in actually Lake Tahoe, California, went through an EMT program myself. And a lot of it is, uh, you know, they say it's one of the hardest careers to get into in California. I forgot the statistic. I think it was like 10,000 to one of people who want to be a firefighter. And then out of a hundred of those, you know, there's, there, there's some statistics. Yeah. So it, it's, it's pretty, pretty competitive. Um, the job is a blessing in itself. However, uh, it takes a lot of hard work to get there. And that's why, you know, I hold the word and the badge to my heart a lot. You know, I definitely earned it. And that's why you see in this profession, there's so much pride. Off-duty apparel companies, firefighter bike clubs, you know. There's not a lot of careers out there that you see definitely that are just... It's definitely synonymous with, you know, the military careers. It's awesome. And it feels like another big family. But there's a digress. And, and you go through, you get your fire academy, you get your certifications, and you start applying. And, uh, you know, you look for a lo- local fire academy, you get your wildland firefighting certifications and structure fire certifications, and you apply. So, so my department, we hire uh, seasonal firefighters every year, um, usually in the November, December month. And uh, you put in your application and <clears throat> they'll ask for so many different certifications, which hopefully you, you gain those through your fire academy. And you apply, you know, go through the, 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 the process through there. But there's so many different outfits as well. You know, we have private firefighters too. And that's the thing. There's, there's a lot of government contract work out here as well. So there's a lot of guys uh, in Oregon is it <clears throat> is a huge producer of those that you can go through. And you still got to get some of these certifications. Even through them, they offer it and pay for it. And, uh, you know, they have contracts with the Forest Service that they go out and brush and limb trees and set up fuel breaks when they're not on a fire. But then when they get activated, you know, then they actually come out and right. fight fire. So a lot of different avenues you can go. With that, but California is different in the way that you know. You say you, you fight the structure fire, you fight wildland fire. You know, you like FDNY in the city. Well, California is different. Everyone does it, so there is no real structure fire wildland. Everyone is an all risk firefighter, with the exception of some agencies like the, the Forest Service, which primarily focus on the wildland. We all go to everything, and I think that comes from the urban interface that we have. We have so many homes and so many middle of nowhere areas that you got to have that knowledge and, and skill set to actually get out. And one minute I'll be 
digging a line. And then the other minute I'll be switching uniforms, getting on my SDBA, our air tank and going interior on this, this house. So it's different. It's wow. different out here. It's, just, it's a lot to it. It is, but there's a system and, and hopefully it's, it's working. You know, we see it working. Yeah. That's crazy. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Like you guys are all Swiss army knives. Then. <laughs> yeah. The big fat one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the big fat yeah. one. That big old fat guy. And, um, yeah. you know, I have, I have a couple of buddies who've worked in this profession. Like, it is such incredibly hard work. Like, you're on a big line. Like, it's hard to think of something. Like, you, know, if you think of free range American hard work and adventure. Like, you're doing the well, definition of it, man. You're digging a ditch on a timeline. <laughs> yeah. You know what? And it's like a hard one to say, like, oh, yeah, we were, you know, we we're busting our ass last night and things like that. It, you know, it, yeah, you know, it, it, it was tough. You know, it was absolutely tough. Um, but there's guys who do more, you know, and that's it. Like, my hats are off to the, the hand crew guys. I think those guys out there are like, you know, they don't have a fire engine to retreat you. They don't have hose. You know, they're out there digging line. And, you know, just this year, we have a lot of our, our firefighter hand crews as well. And there's, you know, the inmate hand crews as well. We work with those guys, and those guys are, 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 are godsend. You know, a lot of them, they're on by choice with decisions they made in the past, but right then and there, you know, we don't care that it's this prisoner on their pants. Like we're all firefighters and we all, you know, ready to go to work, especially with those hot shots too. So it, it's, it, it's quite the operation. And I, I think that's, it's pretty amazing. You go to one of these fire camps and you're like, Whoa, you know, like finance, logistics, operations, planning, everyone's there and everyone has dual roles. And we just, you know, from, from the feeding to the base camp, to, to fueling up your fire engine. It's, it's literally a city that we set up overnight. Yeah. It's incredible. Now say, say you suddenly find yourself in a worst case scenario. Uh, you're kind of surrounded by fire and you know, it's, it's been shown in, in movies before, but you never like really get the nuts and bolts of, you know, what happens in that situation. Like if you guys have to like hunker down, what, what's that equipment that you're using in order to get through that? So I've personally never, you know, deployed a fire shelter is what we say. Yeah. Thank the Lord. And I hope I never will in my career. Um, you know, unfortunately on this current fire that I'm on, you know, there was a shelter deployment um, and everyone, everyone survived. But in that, in that situation, your, uh, all your options have ran out. So like we were talking about backfiring, you know, that's something that you can do is you can sit there and, and backfire your way out. Like if you're in an area like, all right, we're going to put fire on the ground for life safety reasons and push the fire out and create black. We always say that, you know, one foot in the black, the black and the green and black is, you know, the burnt area. So obviously you can't, you know, rekindle. So that's a, a safe area that you can go into or something we call a TRA, a, a temporary refuge area. That's some area that we kind of like, you know, or a safety zone that we, pre-designate before that, hey, if this thing blows up or gets out of control, we have a major wind shift, we're going to drive our engines, we're all going to, you know, kick butt and hike out and run to this yeah. area right here where we feel safe enough that we don't even have to deploy our fire shelters, that we'll let this fire blow over. And um, yeah, I've, I've been in one of those situations. So not not here in this few years back, but we had to go to a, you know, a safety zone, TRA type of temporary refuge area and let the fire blow over and get back to work as soon as it blows over. Whoa. So yeah, the things that we use for that. Yeah. The fire shelter is there, you know, but you know, thank God I haven't had to, but it's a common occurrence every year. Usually seen in the United States, it, it happens. And, and unfortunately, God bless their hearts, you know, uh, the grand mountain 19 and so many people and, you know, don't, don't come out of that because yeah. that's a last resort. And, and what does that fire shelter consist of? Yeah, so it's a. You ever go to Costco and have a chicken bake? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of those? yeah. Yeah. So it it is a basically an aluminum, not the exact material, but basically a uh, those aluminum uh, emergency blankets type of thing. It's Just a lot like, heavier, so it's, yeah. It, yeah, it's all folded up. Carry it underneath my pack, underneath the back, and basically you pull it out and you shake it out. And uh, you climb into it, and um, it's got aluminum reflective material in there. It's got handles for to hold it down because usually in that time there there'll be high winds, whether it's from the fire just ripping through or you know a wind event. 
and uh, you know, reflects all the heat that it can. And uh, you sit there and you know, keep your face down. You should take some water in there with you and a radio and uh, try to cover your face as much as you can and let this fire, fire blow over you. So, Holy crap. That's not a lot. That's not a lot between it's, you and the, the sh- thing that's trying to kill you. Especially when you describe it as like the thing the chicken bait comes in. Yeah. I can't imagine it yeah. stays cool when you're doing that. No. No. Yeah. You know, and and, and, and I almost hate to say this and I don't even want to <sighs> joke about it. So we, we have these practice fire shelters. So every yeah. year we do you know, recertifications and, uh, you know, they're just small little tarps, thin tarps. And you will sit in there for like 10 minutes or we'll do a timer and be like, hey, you know, <clears throat> we'll do a case study just like those workout of the days that we do yeah. um, at the firehouse. And we're like, all right, we're going to do a six minutes and 23 seconds because that's how long, you know, hotshot crew one was in their shelters for. So we're going to send these shelters for that long. And my Lord, like, you know, after like three minutes, I'm not even a full shelter. I'm in there sweating, claustrophobic, everyone's breathing heavy. And we're like, geez, I couldn't imagine. Then you throw fire in. It's like, so I, yeah, it's, Incredible. It's definitely, yeah, yeah, it is, it is, and, and guys who survive for that. I mean, those are the guys that I want to, you know, chat with and learn from. Like, you know, what was your decisions? How did you even make this? How did you get through it? What was going on right. in your heads? And sometimes you just fucking, you know, you tear up. You're just like, holy smokes, just talking to you know the Medal of Honor recipient or something like that. I'm like, wow. So, yeah, in um yeah. on the on the preparation side of this. Um, I'm sure you guys all have a, a different, um, kind of theory when it comes to fitness. Like I I'm of the assumption that like, this is of high priority to you guys to make sure that you're maintaining uh, a certain level of fitness. Um, what, what do you kind of do on the prep side to like, just stay at the certain level you want to stay at? Absolutely. So like on our, <clears throat> On our days of well, on this fire assignment, you know, we're, we're working out already, you know, doing our job. So we were 24 hours off as I'm on like right now. And after this interview, you know, I'll take a shower and hunker down and go to bed. So there's not so much on these that I'm doing. However, at the station level, yeah, absolutely. We work out, you know, one or two hours a day, if not more. You know, we're a lot of times to actually work out. We have a full gym and, you know, brute bags and all those type of things that, a lot of guys are in a CrossFit, some guys are just in their powerlifting, but we hike a lot too. So we kind of do workouts that are applicable to the job. Right. So we'll get, we'll get, you know, throw host packs on our packs and hike up a steep ass hill and go from there. Or maybe do push ups on the way up or lunges or things like that, or fill up inch and a half hose. That's what we use. And, you know, fill it up and cap it and drag those hose. So physical porn is imperative. Yeah. It's, it's a huge thing in our, you know, cooking and eating. You got to be good at both at the firehouse. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you're gonna, well, if you're working out that much, yeah. you're going to be eating a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, working out is a big thing for sure. And, you know, if we have a, an assignment that, you know, we're not that physically active, we'll get out and do something. We'll just bust out some push ups or do some body weight workouts, things like that, or hit up the hotel gym here, something like that, if there is one. Yeah. And yeah. as far as like when, when you're out and about, like, what's like on your body as far as like, you guys have to make sure that you're putting food in your bodies to keep those energy levels high. Like what's kind of your well, EDC, so and, to speak. And you mentioned yeah, so you, yeah, you, yeah. Like, like you have the shelter, like you, what else is there? Like, what are you carrying? What's standard? What's, you know, something you can choose versus somebody else. Like, are there things you guys yeah. have to carry in, in certain places on your body, you know, stuff standardized like that? Absolutely. And this is kind of where, you know, I mentioned the military and, and how, Reviving back, yes, if somebody wanted to do this as a career, I'd probably hit them up and be like, hey, uh, join the military first. Yeah, because yeah. so many things that I have learned in the military, embracing the stock and Air Force jokes aside, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just getting yelled at, you know, at Lackland, like, oh, Lord, you know, like, what is this guy yelling at me for? You know, go through a fire academy? Like, I've done this before. Yeah. You know, so that it gives you a huge advantage already. Um, so that being said, you know, hiking a lot with a lot of weight and professionalism. So, uh, you know, on a fire, we all, uh, you know, essential stuff. We have our, our gloves, uh, you know, almost like pig hide gloves that we wear. Um, we have Nomex. That's the fire resistant material mm-hmm. that we wear. So we have a Nomex pants, Nomex top. Um, again, like our, our plastic helmets for the wildland. We have a shroud that goes over and we can wrap around our face. And that's used, uh, 
usually, you know, right in front of the fire front, fire front, some, uh, a lot of guys were in the Oakley standard issue stuff. So we all kind of pick and choose from there. What glasses and an ESS goggles or something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't really doubt I'm just wearing a you know, hundred percent cotton t-shirt in the event that if we did get burnt, you know, that polyester is not, you know, Melting. gluing to our yeah, skin. Right. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> you do cotton socks and, and boots. And, uh, so whites or Nicks. This is kind of like Nick's is what I wear, and there's other types of Danner makes some great boots too. So usually, you know, just thigh room sole, eight inch log type of type of boots. Yeah. Essentially, these overgrown logging, smoke jumper style boots. Um, and then the pack wise, uh, again, like I was saying, the military stuff. You know, I had a mystery ranch at the my unit, so same thing. Like mystery ranch makes our packs and wolf pack and other things. So that's kind of where different type of styles. They have to be kind of approved with the department, but you'll see a couple people running different style packs. And um, it, it's almost like a really nice, you know, a backpacking pack. It's got, you know, Camelback on there, you know, 100 milliliters type of thing, a hundred liter, sorry. And then uh, your fire shelter, that's pretty much mandatory right there and some sort of ignition device. Yeah. So I'll carry a lighter or we carry those fuses that I was talking with. And that's for, you know, an area that if we're in a crappy area that we need to deploy our shelter and we're in grass, we're going to burn out that grass right in front of me and make some black and, and put our shelter underneath there. And that's kind of like the basic, you know, minimum of what we need to carry. Um, for my EDC wise, like I have a, I have a hose clamp as well on there. So if we're doing a, a hose lay and that's a common, we'll start a fire engine, we'll go up a hill and at least inch and a half hose and a hundred feet of it to get to the fire. So we have to clamp it while the engine's screaming, pumping. And then, you know, one guy hooks up another nozzle on a hose pack and we keep on going up that hill until we can, you know, our user term wrap the fire. And then in my uh, little like it's just like EDC kit that I that I got on there, uh, mandatory toilet paper. <laughs> got <laughs> not baby wipes. Oh yeah, not baby wipes. You guys have to be able to see. I, hey, you know, some oh. baby wipes the package leak and it's almost a pain in the ass, and then it's all crusty and whatever. So I'm like, I'll just take the toilet paper. <laughs> it always happens. So <laughs> he gets the toilet paper in there. Uh, a couple of reducers, you know, for the hose. A couple little tools. Um, a power bar or two, clip bar, whatever you know, whatever you have on there. Some jelly bellies or something like that some guys have yeah. little things that remind them of home a little bit um you know pictures of the family things like that so we all kind of set our packs out on them now if we're going to an extended thing that we know Ray, we're going to be away from the engine for about 24 hours obviously a lunch so that's something that you know we'll pick up at base camp usually the morning of and we'll just you know shove a couple uncrustables in there yeah. <laughs> or some or some beef jerky and and hopefully that'll sustain us you know but you got any coffee on so, body? Oh yeah, instant sticks. Yeah, yeah, yep. So the little, uh, uh, the little coffee, excuse me, lunch kits that they give us. There's some Nestle coffee in there, so usually that's something that we can do. Now it, it's kind of harder for them to know where to actually find something, but when you're that tired, you know, we're all doing weird stuff out there, drinking it cold, just slamming the whole pack of coffee <laughs> right underneath the tongue, you know, all that type of stuff. Uh, yeah, I remember those MRE yeah. days. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, getting like no, no, just, no. just yeah. rub it in your yeah. gums and you're like, oh, exactly. I just yeah. want the and, flavor. <laughs> and make sure you bring enough chew, you know. Uh, there. Yeah, a couple cans of Copenhagen or some Red Man, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that'll, that'll get you done. Yeah, that's where I stretch for. We, we should be sponsored by Copenhagen. I think we're probably one of the biggest users of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, dude, just listening to you talk is like, man, there's so many parallels to to being in the military. Like it, it oh, absolutely. As you're going through, like it feels like the same vibe, you know? Yeah. Um is is there any sort of like uh like speeded up transition for for dudes who are coming out of the military who want to like streamline this process? Is there any sort of absolutely. program? Yeah. Do you have absolutely. to grow a mustache? Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and if you are listening to this podcast um i suggest you go over to youtube and just observe this man's beautiful mustache it's one of the finest mustaches i think i've ever had the purview of Absolutely. Witnessing. yeah i remember this, this <laughs> time to do this <laughs> yes yeah don't tell you know she hates it she hates the mustache so every time i go home i get you know i gotta get it shaved but this is when I get to have a little fun and leave yeah. <laughs> yeah. it at that. But um, yeah, so we have a, a thing called Cal Vets. You know, it's a program with our department that if you're a veteran, you get your DD two fourteen, all that submitted through the state. They actually get preference, uh, preference to me on um, 
you know, permanent positions where you apply, you still got to go through the whole process. You still got to have those basic certifications, but then you attach your, you know, uh, 214 on there and, and, and that puts you up a higher level than the okay. standard candidate. Yeah. So, so your stuff goes to the top of the deck ish. Absolutely. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah depending yeah. on that for sure. And then also like the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, um, those guys also have a, uh, 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 work for warriors i think is what they call it i forgot but they have veteran hand crews that are 100 percent veteran there's actually one out of oh, really? some lake yeah yeah and it's pretty actually fascinating we're with some of them actually the first time this year uh up in susanville we had a fire up there the hog fire and there was a Folsom lake hot track crew so shout out to those guys if, if, they, if they listen on to this but they're basically all uh you have to be a veteran on there to be on that crew and uh those guys are essentially a, a type two initial attack crew and uh, they're employed by the BLM. But yeah, you have to be veterans on that crew. Medford has one as well. They're scattered throughout the United States. And um, yeah, and are, so that's why it's not... Yeah, go ahead. Are, are those guys permanent employees? Are they seasonal? Um, or is it a mixture of both? I believe it's a mixture of both. Yeah, most yeah. of them are seasonal with their you know, forestry technician, wildland firefighter okay. program that they have. So most of them are seasonal, but there are some permanent positions to that. I don't know if those permanent positions are veterans themselves, but I yeah. know that you, know, you have to be a veteran to even apply, just like a lot of federal jobs that give you preference. Now, that, that's so, great to hear. And I mean, that's the kind of stuff we're trying to spread around, like through this, you know, like it comes up and these are positions that people might not know about. You know, maybe there's some guy out there that's like, you know, I'd really like to do something and, and keep the community and like, oh, there it is. You know, that's a way to keep that sort of sense of that military community, but do something in the civilian world that's... Absolutely. And even for current vet, like, you know, we talk about the California National Guard, you know, the air and army side. And even that, you know, there's this AGR, you know, those active guard reserve positions and those full-time Title 32 or Title 10 positions that you can actually get. And that was something that was flown on my base down there at the 129th was... They said, hey, do you want to be a full-time fire crew? So not only just that, we know that, hey, this is such an issue that we have. Then instead of just like activating you guys, you know, two-week training, how to do basic fire, and then we're going to put you on the line. Like I knew that, you know, it's kind of part of that whole posse comitata stuff. They had some active duty soldiers, I think, from, was it from Washington come out? And uh, I think from Fort Lewis. And they're like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. You know, these are National Guardsmen. They're active duty. So how does that work working in the state line? So... They found a reason, so they're going to you know federal fires because it's federal land, right? So yeah, yeah. So that's how they kind of got around. Yeah, here's a shovel, bro. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was like like a bunch of guys running strikers, and I was like, oh, here's a Pulaski. Like, oh god, what is this? You know? And yeah, it was interesting. But um, in California itself, there's actually full time National Guard firefighting hand crews now. So it's a thing. So they're actually. Yeah, it's actually held by a Cal Fire fire captain, fire engineer, and firefighters who are usually there as supervisors to drive, and they're actually made up of you know uh, Air National Guardsmen and, and an Army soldier who are actually you know be able to go on this crew, wear the Cal Fire uniform, um, and they actually go out as a hand crew, and they're on the line as we speak huh. right now, being dispatched just to help us, just due to the sheer amount of fires right. that we've had in the state to help out. So there are some awesome programs for yeah. vets and and current guys who are in. Very state, cool. So. Yeah. That, yeah, that that is really good to hear, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely a, a huge help too. So, and uh, like within the breakdown of your team, is there like you within infantry? You got a fire team, and you know you got saw gunner, rifleman, team leader. Yeah, is there is there a speciality? Is there a breakdown similar w- within your team, or is it absolutely, everybody absolutely. does everything? Yeah, so, so in some points, like more in the hand crew, you know, you have like the saw team, you have the guys who are in the clouds, the scraping tools, the cutting tools, the Pulaski's, the guys in the front, you know, the crew bosses, you know, just basically chain of command and ICS, instant command structure, broken down, same thing of, uh, you know, small leaders, leaders within leaders. So those guys are definitely regimented of, of who's going to do what, what tool they're going to use and what order they cut it. So everything's pretty, pretty dialed in with that. <clears throat> On the fire engine side, you know, you have your company officer, you know, your captain or engineer, and then you have your, you know, your senior firefighter usually, or a, typically a newer firefighter or vice versa, two senior ones or, or three. And usually um, different stuff, you know, one guy's usually running the radio, things like that. One guy's helping him map, Hey, where the heck are we going? Look at our, you know, yeah. Our, 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 yeah. So that, that, that in itself, you know, two in the morning, you get dispatched, you got to figure it out. The company officers worry about driving and getting there, not killing us. 
And then you're worried about, you know, maps, what tax frequencies are we going to be running on? Who's your yeah. cooperating agencies? And the guy in the back's, you know, programming radios. What do we need? All right, we're going to a house fire. We're even going to yeah. a, a simple, we call it medical call. So there's still kind of like unwritten rules, but just like that, you, you guys know, like the crew cohesion stuff, you know, once you do it for a while with that same crew, you don't got to say anything. Well, and, and we I'm all know we're going to the right fires. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody knows how to do everything, but some guys are better at X versus Y. Like, absolutely. Maybe some absolutely. guy can run, run a chainsaw, you know, better than a quickie saw or whatever the case may be. And I'm sure you guys are just letting the most efficient function happen, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that I was like, I'm comfortable cutting down this tree. I'll pass it on. And just yeah. knowing that. And being, you know, humble about it, knowing you're, because that's when, you know, that's when you get hurt. So yeah, it's like, yeah. hey, I don't know how to do this and no one's going to, well, we may make fun of each other, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> <As they should. laughs> but, as they should, but I, yeah, in fact, I'm, yeah, we will make fun of you, you know, it's just one of those things, but, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, just like my crew right now, I mean, the great group of guys, we're all from the same firehouse, um, uh, where I'm out of, out of actually the Susan Lassen County. So I'm out of Northeast California is where my firehouse is at. Okay. Um, it's about, you know, three hour drive South to where I'm currently at right now. And, uh, we, yeah, we, we don't even got to say anything already. You know, when we pull up to base camp, what we got to do is going to take out the trash. We all know usually what we need to do and it, it works a lot better like that, but all that just like anything. Yeah. And that's something just like the military stuff. It's a lot of training. So yeah. before this 2020 fire siege, siege, you know, they're calling it, it's, uh, there was a lot of training before, you know, and, and we get there and we run drills and training and train and train and train and train. And then it's, so the firehouse all about, you know, training, eating and working out. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I think we know that life a little bit. Yeah. Right. Well, boys, uh, dude, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to sit down and yeah. kind of let us know what's going on. I think it's, I think it's really important that the rest of the country knows the the what you guys are doing and the the sacrifices you guys are making right now so so really appreciate you coming on man no i definitely am super humbled for this interview you know reaching out things like that um and just last thing you know it's just it's such like a appreciate you guys reaching out to me but it's like if i could pick you know 10 other men or women out there on the line we could definitely give you a better interview and it's uh yeah, there's a lot of people out there right now that are just busting their ass. And I think that's the, cr the crazy part about it, that anyone can agree or disagree about the politics of what's going on, but there's the work that, that needs to be done. And uh, I think with that, we're going we're to get through this eventually. It just might be a few more weeks. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you do want to support these guys, uh, Black Rifle Coffee is running a buy bag, give a bag initiative right now. So if you go over to Black Rival Coffee, anything that you purchase, any coffee purchase on the site will be matched. And we're we're collecting addresses right now to to get all these guys coffee and, and keep them fueled up as put these things out. So is there a uh, head over there and is there any uh social media stuff or uh any accounts that you want to plug? Yeah, no, I mean uh you know, I try to get on there, you know, the side thing is you know I I'm a little competitive shooter and things like that on the side when I can get out. So, I, you know, trying to get the Instagram thing going, but I feel like maybe I'm aging myself a little bit because sometimes I don't even have enough time. I can't make that one post a day thing, but <clears throat> I'm on there, uh, you know, smoky underscore the bear is my, uh, my Instagram <laughs> handle B B A E R. Um, shout out to, you know, I, I shoot for an awesome gun store out there in Medford, Oregon, uh, black, <clears throat> excuse me, um, black flag armory. So that's in Medford, Oregon. I shoot for those guys. I do the law enforcement and military sales on the, the off season. So uh, Black Flag Armory, those guys out there. So so many companies have been, you know, nice to me. Six Hour has been great, you know, gray guns, things like that. So a lot of a lot of solid companies that's been good to me and things like that. But Smokey underscore the bear is where you find me at. Cool. All right. Well, thanks yeah. for listening, guys. And thank you for being a great American. This This was awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Thanks for the blessing. You guys be safe. Thanks, man. You too.